On this week's episode, a review of the new Jake Gyllenhaal movie, The Covenants, and an interview with one of the star actors from the film. We also talk about the movies that were so bad that we walked out of the theater, and the Power Rangers are back in a new movie, but is it worth watching? This is The Hub on Hollywood. I'm James. I'm Jamie. It is Morphin time. Let's go. Let's go. All right, Jamie, welcome back. Another, we have a really great show this week. Not only do we have some fun, really cool reviews, but we, but we also have this great interview with, as we yes. mentioned, an actor from the new Jake Gyllenhaal movie, The Covenants. Yes, Christian Ochoa Lavernia, um, who has one of the speaking roles, one of the main speaking roles in this incredible movie um, that is about the Afghan war and the the very many translators that worked with the U.S. military uh, during that 20-year campaign. Uh, We're very excited to talk to Chris about his time on set and his journey as an actor. Um, Also happens to be one of my friends from high school, so we're just very (laughs) excited. No big deal. uh, Just so excited for um, his success and for his family, and he's got just this beautiful attitude towards life, which we can't wait to share with you. So stay tuned uh, for that interview a little later on in this episode. But we've got a couple of other things we want to talk about first. Yeah, that's right. So moving from actors from Miami, let's talk about actors from Boston, (laughs) the good old boys, Ben Affleck and Matt Damon. They are the gifts that just keeps on giving. Uh, Just like last week, we're mentioning that they were on this movie media tour talking about air, talking about their uh, their other projects. And uh, Ben Affleck uh, popped on the Drew Barrymore show, which is a really fun show. I think she's a really good actor, actress turned uh, TV talk show. In case you haven't seen it, that's pretty good. But... In this uh, last episode of of Drew, Ben says that he and Matt Damon blew through all the money they made selling the script for Goodwill Hunting in just six months. It's it's pretty unbelievable. So he says uh, they sold the script to a studio for six hundred thousand dollars. That's back then money, which I'm sure with adjusted with inflation, much more. But he says after that six hundred thousand dollar purchase or selling it, he and Matt split it three hundred thousand thousand dollars each ways uh their agents got thirty thousand dollars leaving them with two hundred and seventy thousand dollars then they paid a hundred and sixty thousand dollars in taxes so after that they were left with a hundred and ten thousand dollars after that they decided to buy fifty five thousand dollar jeep cherokees and then they spent the final fifty five thousand dollars paying for this party house uh, in the Hollywood Hills by the Hollywood Bowl. And they said after six months, they were back to being broke. Um, <laughs> it, it doesn't surprise me that, you know, young guys in their 20s who found big success blew through that money. Like, I don't know what else you would do, but it's a good thing well, they got more movie roles afterwards. I think that maybe perhaps the first thing you should get is a financial advisor. <laughs> Yeah, Uh, that might help a little bit. Um, But if you think about it, though, after taxes, oh man, that killed um, them. I mean, it's that that is not necessarily a lot of money, right? Mm -hmm. And you've got to make that stretch. So it's definitely not an amount of money I think that would last you a lifetime. You've got to keep working. But you would think that maybe it would last more than six months. Yeah, they especially you know I understand you're you're the new guys in Hollywood. You're the new big thing, and you want to live in the Hollywood Hills. But there are paying five thousand dollars a month in rent at this party house and so there are there are areas where you can you know cut back save money Uh, i understand (laughs) buying cars which is cool you know if you need a car especially especially in la you need a car so i understand that too but at the same time like you don't know if you're going to get another big movie you know odds are they were because they won an oscar for goodwill hunting but you know nothing's guaranteed so it's it's just funny you just (laughs) see these guys from boston go to hollywood and in six months you know burn through their wallet uh, again good you know thing what? they're very talented and got more got more work yeah i was gonna say they they're doing just fine for themselves <laughs> i think it all worked out in the end um and i bet they had a lot of fun in their their what their green jeep cherokees you said <laughs> yeah 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 you know what's funny too uh, it's funny because uh, as we mentioned last week in the in the on the hub on hollywood ben affleck was saying matt damon was the roommate from hell so they could have used some of that money to pay for like cleaning services right, right? yeah <laughs> 
get a maid for your yeah. your Hollywood Hills apartment that you're renting. You got to buy, man. The the renting, you're just throwing your money away. Financial advisor. Okay, yeah. financial advisor. If you're going to like start it big and start making these big big bucks like I you wonder know, get someone to help you <laughs> I wonder if they talked to mom and dad back home they would have been like no you're not gonna touch that money you're gonna put that under your mattress like I think they I think their their parents or their family would have uh, held them accountable like no 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 yeah. mr. big shot Hollywood you leave Boston and you go over there spending all this money like no put it under your mattress <laughs> <laughs> that's funny I love it. so um, let's talk about this next thing because this is a blast from the past um, th- I think everybody in the 90s who grew up in the 90s as a child, as a kid growing up, they watched the Power Rangers, the Mighty Morphin Power Rangers. And uh, right. it's gone through so many different generations, so many different actors. But I understand that a new movie on Netflix brought back some of the OGs. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> OMG. Any millennial, uh, you know, who grew up in the 90s, uh, early 2000s, you know, you ran home from school every day in order to catch the Power Rangers that week. And now you can hop onto Netflix in your living room and watch the brand new Mighty Morphin Power Rangers now and forever movie uh, that has just come out. Is it worth watching, I think, is the big question. I watched it with my husband this morning, and I have got to say it is a resounding yes. All Back right. for the action, of course. Um, we've got some of the OG characters, as you were mentioning. We've got Zach. We've got Billy. <laughs> yeah. And um, who are uh, the main protagonists here. And great homages to the rest of the original cast, two of whom we lost. We have lost um, Jason David Frank most recently. Yeah, the Green um, Ranger. And there are in memoriams to them. Um, but they do just a fabulous job of bringing back the corniness, <laughs> uh, everything the that you loved, the campiness, the corniness, everything that you loved about the original series that, you know, back when you were a kid was just like so amazing, so dramatic. Like you were actually like afraid for these characters, like, um, and just, of course, the costumes. We've got Rita Repulsa back as a robot uh, with the original <laughs> voice actress, you know, lending her prowess uh, to that role. And I would say she's actually kind of scary this time around. Um, and we've got new generations as well. We've got the daughter of Trini who is back um, and, and gets to be a part of this adventure. I have not cheered and laughed so hard for a film in such a long time. Uh, my husband and I, we just had so, so much fun nice. uh, watching this film. So we'll have a full review next week for the Power Rangers movie on Netflix, but I, you know, if you are a millennial or perhaps someone who raised a millennial, anyone who loved or watched the original Power Rangers, um, this new film on Netflix does such great justice to the original spirit of everything that is Power Rangers. And you got to go watch it right now. Don't walk. Run nice. to your couch. Nice. Run to yeah. your couch. Hop in with your favorite snack and just be transported. Yeah, uh, I know. I know. It, I know a lot of kids growing time. up. <laughs> it's morphin time. I know a lot of kids growing up. They loved the Red Ranger. They loved the Green Ranger as their favorite. But my favorite Rangers were the Black and Blue Rangers. I had the toys. I had like the plush like doll that like the Black uh, Ranger doll that I would sleep with as as a kid. And so yeah, it's it's cool that the even though they're not they were not like the most prominent. Like you know like again everyone loved the Red and Green Rangers. Uh, but the Black and Blue were my personal favorite. So it's good to see them uh, in the spotlight taking taking charge as the main uh, protagonist in this film. So cool. Mighty yes. Morphin Time. Love uh, it. Yes, Mighty Morphin Time. Ultra cheesy. David Yost, Walter Manuel Jones. Amy Jo Johnson, not, not a part of this one. We have talked to her on the Hub on Hollywood. So uh, let's try to get another Power Ranger uh, up here 
on the Hub on Hollywood, James. We'll try. We'll reach out. And uh, we'll, if you hear this episode, uh, tweet this <laughs> right. link. Li- tweet this episode link uh, to to the Black and Blue Ranger. We'll try to get them on. But um, you you love this movie. Um, you said run to your couch and watch it on Netflix. However, there are movies in the past that we've seen that made us running out of the movie theater because they were so bad. Uh, Reddit had a discussion about this, a thread asking, you know, have you ever seen a, mo- a movie at a theater that was so bad that you walked out and many people listed the worst movie experiences and some of these are not a big surprise so i can go down the quick list and i'm sure you, you can guess some of these um some of these terrible movies but we'll start with cats uh the remake the new cats <laughs> movie the digital atrocity catrocity <laughs> that came out a couple years ago uh yeah. battlefield earth starring john travolta was a really uh popular one when it came to people bashing it saying how, just how bad it was and the next one is one that i think that you will uh, wholeheartedly agree with was a terrible movie which was the last airbender directed by m oh, night Shyamalan. god I have never experienced in a movie theater <laughs> the excitement drain out of a room. Like, like I went opening night with all of these Airbender fans and everyone was so excited and so pumped and dressed up and it was like air being let out of a balloon like by the end of it people were literally yelling like his name is Aang because they decided like his name needed to be pronounced differently and like people were just yelling in anger and they left so distraught including myself so I absolutely um, agree with that one. I have two others on my personal list James that um, can you tell me if these are on the list? Yeah sure. Um, but wanted to walk out of Indiana Jones and the Crystal Skull. Ooh, that's a good one. That's a good one. Yeah. Almost, almost, my husband almost left me over that one. I wouldn't stop <laughs> ranting about it for a week and a half. Um, and The Rise of Skywalker. Star Wars, The Rise Ooh. of Skywalker. Wanted to ri- walk out of that one. The only one movie I've ever actually truly walked out of because it was so awful to me. And that was Aquaman. That wow. was the first Aquaman that just came I out. I fell asleep at the end of... I missed the entire third act of the film. One, it was a little long. I think it was like two hours and 30 or 40 minutes long. But I fell asleep during the last battle. So I woke up with like... I woke up to like this battlefield of like underwater like madness. Yeah. I'm like, I have, I have no <laughs> idea what's going on. <laughs> yeah, it's just, just so long and boring and uninspired like i just couldn't take it anymore i'm like i'm not sitting through the rest of this cga cgi crap like i don't care about any of the relationships any of the characters like this is just i just left i'm like i got better things to do um nice is there one that you've actually walked out of? So uh, there are two that come to mind when uh, when I walk out. And usually I give many movies the benefit of the doubt, but there are some that just are so bad that uh, I, I couldn't sit in the seats any longer. One was this movie called Getaway in 2013. Did you know that Ethan Hawke and Selena Gomez were in a movie together? No. <laughs> yes. They were in a movie together in, back in 2013. It's a bore fest. It's supposed to be, you know, Ethan Hawke is this washed up uh, former race car driver. He comes home one day, his, his house is ransacked, his wife is missing. And then, like, there's this mysterious voice who tells him, like, who calls him and tells him, you had to do this, this, and this. And, and in, in order to get your wife back and make sure she's alive. And then he runs into this. Uh, they describe her as a young woman, and she was, like, of age at this time. But she looks, but Selena Gomez looks such like a baby. You just look at this like, this is like a little teenager girl who like tries to carjack Ethan Hawke, but then Ethan Hawke gets to the upper hand. And then like the voice is like, okay, now use her and you guys are going to work together to you know solve this puzzle or whatever so his wife can live and it's just a bad movie it was just, it, it was this, the first act was so bad i'm like i don't care about any of this and my dad and i left mm. the other movie that my dad and i also walked out on was anger management uh starring adam sandler and jack nicholson that one I, it's not my cup of tea i don't know that one just was not working for for either one of us and we walked out got our money back 
don't recommend oh, those I'm too. Impressed that, I'm impressed that you got your money back. I've never even tried to do that. So. Yeah, so, sometimes it depends. And so if, if you go into a movie and, it, and it's maybe still 15 minutes, like say the movie started and you're only 15 minutes in, if you go back, they'll give you a refund. But you can't like after 30 or, or an hour. At that point, it's like yeah. you've already seen like half the movie. And so you have to, you have to make that decision. That's why many people don't decide to walk out on a bad movie is because they like, oh, I've already committed too much time and I'm probably not going to get right. my money back. So I might as well just watch this movie uh, in, in agony. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm curious. Well, I did, yeah. Yeah, I did know that there are some people that, you know, walk out of movies because of false advertising, essentially. Like what yeah. they show in the trailer is not what comes out, right? Is not what they're experiencing in the, in the cinema. Mm-hmm. Um, I had one friend who went to go see Frozen with his kid, with his son, and they ended up walking out because they thought they were expecting a movie about a snowman. They were expecting oh, wow. the movie to be about Olaf, right? Because they had used this snowman so much in the advertisement, but he didn't actually come out until like 45 minutes into the movie. Wow. So um, that was an unexpected one. But yeah, so what kind of movies have you guys walked out of that were just so, so terrible? It was not even worth your time anymore. Screw my money. Like, throw (laughs) your popcorn down and just storm out of the theater. Let us know down in the comments. Again, you can find us everywhere. We are on Facebook. We are on Twitter, uh, Instagram, and TikTok at Hub on Hollywood. Leave your comments. Le- let us know. Yeah, what, what are some of those movies that had your blood and butter and your popcorn boiling uh, so much that you that you <laughs> walked out? Um, you can also not only can you catch us on YouTube, listen there, but you can also listen to us on any of the major podcasting streaming services like Apple Podcasts, Spotify, iHeart Radio. Be sure to leave us a five star our review it really does help out the podcast and uh, get us out there and we try to get more you know more publicity more uh, uh interviews on this show and uh, we actually have a really good one coming up right yes i am so excited um that we can bring this interview to you with uh mr christian ochoa lavernia um and rising star in hollywood who got to play a character called Eduardo Chao Chao Lopez in the film The Covenant, starring Jake Gyllenhaal and Dar Salim. This film is not based on a single true story, but rather an amalgamation of many stories between the U.S. military and Afghan interpreters who risked their lives in this conflict, in this 20 year war um, to support us and to fight the Taliban and to fight for their families um, and for and support our efforts there. Uh, thousands of these interpreters um, were promised visas in exchange for their work. Uh, many were left behind. And that is what this film is trying to draw attention to. Um, So this is a Guy Ritchie film. We'll have a full review after this interview, but Christian Ochoa Lavernia, um, a phenomenal guy. Yeah, and I understand that you... And I understand that you got this interview right before he was going to the red carpet event. So it was kind of, uh, yes. it, we, 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 were, we were doing our best with the interview, uh, but there may be some dropouts or whatnot, but that was because he was going to the, to the red carpet. So, yeah. you know, yeah, he, he, he was made so time gracious for us. to give us his time. Right. You're making time for us in between appointments as he and his family um, and his mom and his sister were all preparing to walk the red carpet for the pre- premiere of Covenant um, with them. So I uh, get many pictures of him with with the, you know, the cast um, and phenomenal interviews that he gave on that day and that he gave to us. So without further ado, here's Chris. And I am joined by a very exciting rising star in Hollywood, big Cuban boy from Miami, <laughs> and uh, old friend of mine, Chris Ochoa. Le, le... <laughs> Lavernia. Lavernia. And, yeah, no, there we go. Funny. Yeah, it's funny. Like, no one ever from high school knew me by that name. But the reason why I did it was uh, I am an Ochoa, and I always was, but I, my mom's side of the family is Lavernia. Mm-hmm. And truthfully, um, they were who raised me, where was my mom's side of the family. Although my mom kept the name Ochoa so that my sister and I didn't feel alienated from our mom. But mm-hmm. really, she's Maria, La- she's Maria Lavernia. So 
my grandpa who raised me, who was like kind of my dad figure, if you will. Um, he was Lavernia. He was Jose M. Lavernia. Everybody would call him Lavernia. And mm-hmm. it's a beautiful name. It's a French name. Uh, means born in the spring. And Ochoa, which is really cool, is Basque, and it means wolf. Wow. Uh, yeah. So my name is Christian, wolf, born in the spring. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so anyway, I, I felt like it was important to honor that part of my family and stuff. And I love my Ochoa side of the family. I really do. Um, but really, I was raised by the Lavernia side of the family. That's awesome. And so that's where people can find you, right? At Christian Ochoa Lavernia La- on yeah. the socials, right? Socials, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And IMDb and all that stuff. So, Chris, you now, uh, you've been working very hard. And you've got a handful of uh, big credits under your belt now in film and television. And, you know, you've been Little working so hard. Um, so let's start off with this huge role. Hitting theaters in just a couple of days, April 21st. The Covenant, starring Jake Gyllenhaal, directed by Guy Ritchie. Um, why don't we start off with, how did you find out that you landed this role? Um, and who are you? <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. I also want to say what you said was perfect, but I also do want to say starring Jake Gyllenhaal and Dar Salim, who is the heart of this film. He really is. He is the heart and soul of this film. And he is such an amazing man. Um, he's uh, he's out of Denmark and he came on this film. And really, the movie was actually called The Interpreter for many. That's what we called it. And mm-hmm. Uh, it wasn't until recently that they changed the name to The Covenant, which I think is powerful, right? Because it means like the promise, really. And that's what the movie's about. But it was really called The Interpreter. So the film is about, it's really about Dar Salim's character, um, mm-hmm. Ahmed, who's, a, who's at the center of it, right? Um, and really interesting enough, my wife was um, costumed. Oh, this is fun. This is going to be a fun story. My wife was costumed designing the film. And I'm like, this is not post-pandemic, right? I'm like 30 pounds heavier and drinking drinking a beer going to the you know kitchen to get a beer and i have my headsets on because i'm playing Warzone with my buddies uh back in miami right i still kept in touch with a lot of friends from high school and we still we play Warzone right on playstation well i'm playstation or xbox that's a whole contention whatever it is what it is whatever <laughs> um so i'm going to the kitchen and i'm grabbing a beer and i see uh you know my wife working on something and she was costume designing the film she's a costume designer she's already costume designing this film i'm like hey what you, what you working on there huh and she's like uh She's, you know, she's English. She's like, well, I'm, I'm doing, um, you know, fucking research. Yeah. And I'm like, okay, cool. I'm like, and I'm, I just say like a sly comment. I'm like, you know, if I was one of those soldiers, I'd be wearing a baseball cap. Right. And she's like, uh, they don't wear baseball caps. I'm like, like, yeah, they fucking do. And then she's like, whatever. The next time I'm at the gym, I'm at the gym and I'm a man on a mission. Right. I'm like, oh, I'm going to show her. And I start Googling all these pictures of people, um, wearing hats. Right baseball caps and soldiers and whatnot. I'm like, boom, boom, bam, boom, boom. And she's like, oh shit. Okay. Let me, let me, let me go search a little harder, whatever. But it wasn't like, it was fun. It was fun competition because I'm like, I know this. And some, she schools me more than I ever school her. She dunks on me all the time. So like it's respect. And, um, so she, um, we find this little tidbit out. She's doing her research. And as a, if you can hear me muffled, it's cause I'm smoking a cigar. Am I not? Can you confirm this? Yeah, I can confirm that. I was going to mention that at some point, too. It's like the occasional pauses. That's because mm-hmm. he is puffing away at this giant cigar, uh, yeah. you know, being the, you know. El Septimo very, cigars. Very, I, yeah. Yeah. very Cuban. Very, 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 Cuban, very Cuban man Cuban. that he is, yeah. Mm-hmm. So they're called El Septimo oh cigars. God, I got it. <laughs> in L.A. Um, no, I almost dropped it, yeah. Um, so anyway, I'm... <laughs> So I, speaking of cigars, the reason I brought that up is because I go, I used to go to a cigar shop in, in California called um, the Old Oaks Cigar Shop in Thousand Oaks. Great guys, Albert and our scene, if they ever hear this, I love them. And uh, so I used to go every uh, Friday, Saturday, I used to play with my, my manager um, at the time. I used to play um, backgammon for hours. We would go there, smoke cigars, play backgammon, blah, 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 till like 12 o'clock at night. Bunch of older dudes, really awesome dudes, some of the best people I met. That night it was packed, super busy. So I go to the back table, and uh, there is two gentlemen sitting there, younger guy and kind of a you know, old guy about my age and a younger guy. And uh, whatever they're sitting, so we're Brad and I are sitting down, we're talking, and these guys kind of they're gregarious, right? So they jump into mm-hmm. conversation. We we and then we ended up talking for five hours, and I learned from one of the gentlemen. His name is Dan Schmidt. 
and he was uh he was in the military you know purple heart you know like, i mean all these words and one of the nicest guys i've ever met that turned into a friendship in los angeles which i love with my favorite friendships in los angeles are the ones that had nothing to do with the entertainment industry just real genuine human being human beings and he'd grab a bottle of wine he's very formal he's like christian i've got a 1997 merlot whatever and i'm like he's like would you like to come and join me and drink and i'm like absolutely dan <laughs> you know like one of those things and we drink and then get drunk and i'd stay over so we had that kind of friendship and then uh it's one of those where like i'd go over his house and he lives so far that i'd get drunk and i'm like i'm not gonna drive home i'm gonna stay on the couch so like hey dan I, he's like yeah stay on the couch man so i would call my my wife who wasn't my wife at the time and i'm like hey i'm staying in dan's house we had too much wine so I'm like, do you remember that guy? Do you remember him? She's like, yeah. I'm like, dude, he's like an almanac of anything army, everything army. And I was mm -hmm. like, you want me to just email him? And then maybe you can ask him a couple questions. She's like, sure. To make a extremely long story short, because I can go on. He <laughs> ended up being, he ended up, damn, ended up being the military advisor on the film. Wow. And then he brought in. Um, and in this kind of thing that they figured out, Dan and my wife figured out, oh, these guys are special forces because he's like, oh, if they're pulling that kind of missions, they're green berets. So then that got brought into the fold. Then the production themselves started using Dan. From there, he brought in actual green berets. And then there was one, Kawa Malawi, who was actually was a green beret for many years. And he's actually over in Texas now. And he's got like a tactical service where he teaches people how to use, you know, firearms tactically how to enter rooms and whatnot and he actually has worked on other films before and he was so involved in the film and the kind of creation of the ideas because guy has a lot of great ideas but obviously you know guy's making a movie which is one something i want to understand anybody that listens to us now when you watch a military film and you argue and you're mad about like well that's not exactly how they do it so yeah. you can't yeah. you can't always <laughs> do it exactly how you do it you it's a little number one it's, it's hollywood it's show business right. And number two, we, there's a lot of clearances you can't get past. So if a certain a certain patch um, isn't on rights um, or or something on a thing is it's usually because they weren't allowed to do it that way. I think one of our special forces patches is kind of shifted a different way mm -hmm. because uh, you can't you can't do it verbatim. There's clearances, so that's one thing. But anyway, I was so involved in the film that guy made him one of the characters on the film just because he was there. And he knew it. He was special forces. So guys like, fuck, yeah, just fuck it. Just like you're, you know, put on a uniform and, and be one of the guys. That way he was That's on with, you know, we got, yeah, we got trained. We got everything. But Cabo was there literally every shooting moment that we had so that we can do it. So his powers combined with Dan Schmidt, they came together and they made this, this film as authentic as humanly possible from the perspective of costumes, from the perspective of movement of the soldiers and storytelling, you know? So it was really interesting. Right. I'm not saying so, I'm responsible for the film, but, you know, it's, it's, <laughs> the power of suggestion is so powerful. Exactly. Can you talk to us a little bit about some of your favorite experiences on this set and what you took away from this story? Working with Guy Ritchie was, um, honestly, he's been my favorite director. So this, I've been listening to the San the Snatch soundtrack uh -huh. um, during college at FIU when I was walking around campus, when I was working out, when I was running. You know, I, I, the song is Diamond by Clint. Like, I can tell you, like, Angel by Massive Attack, all part of that soundtrack. And it was, became a sound, soundtrack to my life, really. And you have Lock, Stock, and uh, Two Smoking Barrels. All these films, uh, you know, Sherlock and everything. Guy's, guy's got it, his, his style, just as Wes Anderson has his style and Nolan has his. Richie has his. And it's, it's something I've loved forever. So, number one, to be in a Guy Richie film, wow. Holy shit. Can't believe it. That's like pinch yourself and be grateful that you were given the opportunity. Um, secondly, Jake Gyllenhaal was an actor that I have always admired my whole career. Someone I want to emulate because like, I feel like he's a leading man that plays character roles. And that's kind of like what I feel I can be because I feel like my stature and the way I look, everybody's like, oh, you're a leading man. I'm like, no, I'm a, I'm a character actor. And they always say the joke out here in Hollywood is character actors want to be leading men and leading men want to be character actors. But I'm like, you can do both. You, know, you can be you can be Johnny Depp. You can be, you know, um, yeah. So to see him play, but he plays this very grounded and honestly, just like watching him, like a lot of my scenes are with Jake. So I got to watch him work and see where I'm similar, see where I'm different, see where I can get better. And uh, that was incredible. And then, you know, working with my wife, obviously that should have come first. Sorry. But um, <laughs> that was amazing. And it was all, it was all, you know, I didn't get this job because of her. I got this job. I knew about this job because of her. So I reached out to my team and I'm like, Hey guys, they're uh, casting American soldiers uh, and they're casting a bunch of Brits. So, and I'm in England. So let's make this happen. And I got to audition 
And uh, for about two months, I was waiting here, and then I finally heard it, and I got it. So that was by osmosis of energy and manifestation. It happened, and then working with the guys, man, Dar Salim, like what a what a what an incredible human being, what an incredible actor, uh, Jason Wong, who's done a few films with Guy. He's one of my special forces guys. Sean Sager, Reese Yates, Bobby Schofield, working with Dan Schmidt. This guy that I met smoking cigars, you know, mm -hmm. drinking wine in L.A. He was a sanctuary for me in L.A., really, because, you know, it's hard to meet good, good people sometimes in that city where everybody's trying to make it. Everybody's trying to figure out what you can do for them. And Dan was just like, hey, man, you got a bottle of wine. And really, that's all it is at the end of the day when, you, when you're looking for a friend, right? Someone to, right. to just share those moments with, you know, working with him was phenomenal. And, and honestly... There's something about Spain that I love, you know. I I met my my wife working in Spain, and and then I got to come back to Spain to work with her, and uh, you know, being in Alicante, which I thought the people were beautiful, I thought the city was beautiful. It's incredible moments. And listen, working on a film like this, like when you're working on a Guy Ritchie film, right? You think you're working on a, you know, oh, I might fucking hell, you know, like I'm fucking hell, hi. <laughs> Is he over there? Like, is he smoking a blunt? Oh, I think he's smoking a blunt, Mike. Oh, fuck. It's not that. It wasn't that. This is kind of like a departure from that that guy gangster that we love, that we love. And he can put that out to the day he dies, and I'll watch every single one of them. It was a departure, in a sense. Um, and when it was testing, when the movie was testing, it was rating so high. And specifically, what was interesting, it was rating so high with women. Um, mm -hmm. because women usually don't, it doesn't, war films do not sc score high with women. That is a fact. And it was scoring in the 97, 98 percentile. Um, yeah. so it is truthfully at the end the heart of this film is a love story of sacrifice, friendship. And, um, you know, honestly, it doesn't matter where you're from, what creed, religion, race, it doesn't matter. Brotherhood and, uh, sisterhood, mm -hmm. all hoods, um, <laughs> um, how important it is to, to protect each other is at the end of the day, what I've learned, the more I've traveled and thank God I've been able to travel because of my job. It takes me to incredible places. You realize that no matter where we're from, we all want the same thing. We want love. We want security. We want family and we want peace of mind, you know, no matter what your religion says, no matter what your government says. So to, to actually work on a film that where that is the message, I believe at the heart of it, Mm. It is an uh, extreme honor because I try to work on projects that I truly believe in what the message is, right? So that was, I would say, the one of the coolest things I got to do. Speak your truth. That is that is beautiful. That's what I think a lot of people should be doing. And you touched on it a little bit, like, you know, manifesting your reality and, uh, you know, and working hard and having that perseverance. And, you, you, you know, you've really, from the beginning, I, I want to talk a little bit about your journey, right? In, in acting because I yeah. think when we were at, we, when we were at FIU I remember going to a job fair with you and you were like you were looking for like FBI CIA oh you remember that you, like, you remember that go. yeah I remember oh. yeah you're like I'm gonna be a spy yeah and now you kind of get to be these characters <laughs> you get to be a lot of these types of characters you nailed it you nailed it I went to go see Mission Impossible and uh, I drove back home that night like with a fire. Yeah. Fired my ass. So I came out and fired my ass. I called my mom and I go, Mom, what's the one thing you said I should have always done in my life, in my career? And she's like, you should, you should have been an actor. You did drama in middle school at Howard Doolin. I was, uh, I did a Midsummer's Night Stream and I played Bottom, right? He's a character that turns into a donkey halfway. And I loved it. He's like, you were so good at that. She's like, and just even though you didn't do theater in high school, because when I got to Varela, they gave me a, I had to, I had to make a choice. You're like, you play baseball or you do theater. You can't do both. Mm. Thing is, I was an athlete growing up. I love sports. I still do, but I was an athlete. So I chose baseball because like, that's what I thought, you know, I'm like, that's what I love doing. And so I gave up the acting, but she's like, you were so always theatrical, you know, with people and with around, you're always putting on a show. She's like, you should have done that. I'm like, okay. <laughs> and then I'm like, I'm going to do it. So I moved back to Miami. I started working at a restaurant with my buddies. That's my buddy. There's my big brother in my fraternity. He's Giorgio Rappi Gavoli. He has a restaurant in Miami now called Eating House. But before it was like this established restaurant, we were a pop-up restaurant. Mm -hmm. And, that's it. That can be a, its own podcast about the, the <laughs> growth of that and how happy and proud I am of the boys. But basically started working at a restaurant, started little by little going back and, you know, started modeling and stuff because in Miami, that's the market, right? Modeling, you know, right, losing yeah. weight and shape and whatever. This and that. But then, you know, I started really going to acting classes and things like that. La, then I finally auditioned for Burn Notice. And uh, I auditioned for Magic City, actually. I didn't get the, the role, but I remember Lori Wyman, who's like the big casting director in Miami. She's like, why haven't I seen you before? And I'm like, hey, Lori, I've been trying to make it in here, I promise. 
And uh, mm-hmm. I auditioned for Burn Notice a few months later, and I, I booked my first um, guest star role. And, and that's the role that kind of propelled me to say, okay, ready to leave to LA with this and my all the student films I've been doing. My reel was not the greatest of reels, but at least I had a real notice go right, all, right at the top of it. So that could help, right? So I moved I moved over to LA and I won't get into that story. That's a long one, but I will say what I will say is that it was many years of hardship, many years of loneliness, many years of work. I mean, I I, I was a you know, I was a wait server actor. You know, I worked at two yeah. different restaurants. I work in six, seven days a week so I can pay the bills. You know, even though I would do some acting jobs and people, some of my tables recognize me from shows I was on. I'm like, yeah, yeah, I was on that show. Yeah. So how would you like that cook, sir? Meet me anywhere. <laughs> cool. All right, cool. Oh, nice to see you, you know? <laughs> so, but it is what it is. But you have to understand, like I read something once was like, it was like a Dustin Hoffman type. I'm not quite sure. But he said, he said, I wasn't the most talented person to get on the bus to LA, but I never got back on. Right. So it's about really, you know, it's about dropping your ego out here, coming and working, doing the work, learning how to, it's a business, learning how the business works. But also, like, you know, when you're acting, don't take yourself so serious. And it's like, I went through a lot of lessons, you know, when I made, when I made my life just about this career and I based all my happiness on my success on it or not, I was never happy. But when I learned to find the happiness elsewhere in my life, whether it was my wife, my stepson, you know, watching Always Sunny in Philadelphia every night to go to bed, you know, things like that, that you find happiness outside of it, then you really truly say, you know what, everything else is extra. And then I realized once I calmed down, everything else started coming to me. And because I wasn't forcing it, you know, so Mm -hmm. but if you want, you know, acting is it is it is a full time thing in the sense that you have to put your heart and soul into it. Because for every yes that I get, I've had like 150 no's, maybe more, you know, you think about it. Auditioning is the job. Once you get it, it's the fun part. But auditioning right. is the job. You need to audition, get the job, auditioning. So yeah, that's kind of the story. I mean, as 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 con- con- concise as I can be. I love the energy and the spirit that you bring to it. And I think that a lot of people can apply that to their journey and them trying to become actors or break into this space or, or, or achieve yeah. whatever it is that they want to achieve for themselves. You know, and we learn so much along the way. And part of why we started this, podcast, The Hub on Hollywood. Um, We call ourselves Hollywood East out here in uh, Boston, New England, Massachusetts. So many projects coming out here. Every year there's more opportunities. Um, And and lots of people are so, so passionate about movies and filmmaking and and bringing stories and characters to life. So we always have casting calls on our show. And Amazing. things like that. And today we have Chris Ochoa. Um, so I just want to, before I re- let you go, because you've got a big premiere tonight, right? You do. I got <laughs> my mom and sister. something to do tonight. I got my mom and sister inside right now getting their makeup done and getting ready and stuff, getting all dulled up and stuff. Mm-hmm. Big part of, you know, the, the the pleasure of this is not so much that it's my first premiere, it's that my, it's my mom's first premiere. Because if I'm anybody, I'm anything because of her. So this this is her victory. That's wonderful. Uh, what's she wearing? <laughs> Am I allowed to ask? Do you know? know? No, you don't know. It's okay. <laughs> whatever, she thought, whatever she thought, she showed um, it to me. I thought it was beautiful, but I, I, I couldn't tell you. So I know that you've been on. Um, tell us a little bit about, just just list off some of the projects you've been in and a couple of the ones that are coming up. Um, I know you've got a couple of projects that are coming up in the next couple of months, not not just Covenant. So I got Covenant coming out on Friday, April 21st. And then I have uh, Silo on Apple TV coming out on May 5th on Apple TV. Amazing show. Rebecca Ferguson, uh, Tim Robbins, uh, Common. Yeah, Rashid. He's amazing. He's become a really close friend of mine. Um, Just so, I mean, Rashida Jones. I mean, it's got such an incredible cast and people. And it was one of the favorite, my favorite projects I ever worked on because everybody just got on. There wasn't one bad egg, you know? Yeah. Most projects have one bad egg. There's no bad. There's no bad egg in that job. It's fucking, oh, it's fucking awesome. And then next year, sometime around, I don't know when because it hasn't been said. I'm on uh, the second season of Halo for Paramount Plus, so that's going to be fun on Halo. Um, oh so yeah, stay tuned for that. I mean, before that, I did some really cool stuff, man. I was very honored to be uh, on an episode of Will and Grace, which I grew up watching. Um, yeah. That was so much fun, you know. I did pitch, which I get to I got to play a, a defected Cuban American baseball player, which was I mean so part of like my culture, which was incredible. Um, 
I was on a show called Bounty Hunters for Sky One in England, which is actually really funny, but a lot of Americans are not into it because they don't have Sky. Rosie Perez, who I grew up like admiring and loving and whatnot, um, her and Jack Whitehall, who's a big British comedian, but he's like kind of making his way. He was in that movie Jungle Cruise with the Rock for Disney movie. And uh, man, I know just little things here and there, right? Because it's like no, no job, no small job is a, is a small job. You know, everything leads to the next thing. You're building your credits. You're building your fans, right? You got to build fans. You got to get people that love you, directors, producers, and not just the big ones like, oh, the director and the producer. Everybody on set is it's just as important as the director and producer. I don't care what you say, you know, whether you're the guy, um, you know, on the trucks or you're, or you're, you're part of the crafty feeding the people because nothing makes people happier than giving yeah, them food. Yeah. Like everybody's is important. So you're making fans all over the place, right? And you're working hard. And, and uh, so every job I ever had was a blessing. Um, and it was a step closer, you know, and I'm not nowhere near done. I'm just getting yeah. started. Exactly. But, um, what, are, what is your dream role? Uh, before I let you go, what, what do you need to check off of your bucket list? What do you want to play? I wish I could tell you that, but I don't. I keep those close to the chest. Okay. All right. No worries. Yeah. <laughs> For you the, say, between you and the universe. Exactly. But listen, I will say what I do want to be, if I could be any actor, I'd be, I would love the career of like Johnny Depp before last year or whatever year it was. Uh -huh. But in the sense that like he, you know, he's as good as Jackson, Captain Jack Sparrow as he is as Whitey Bulger, right? When he's playing that mm -hmm. Boston guy and like that kind of role that you can just jump into anything and people believe it. And I think that's my, yeah. that's what I, I want to be. And that's what, how I kind of hone my craft, right? It's not just to be the funny guy or just to be the serious guy. Cause for so many years I wanted to be just like Tom Hardy, which I still do. He's such a fucking badass. Yeah. Peaky blinders, baby. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. But um, I want to be able to do that. But I also want to be able to jump into something and be a complete clown. All right, Chris Ochoa, thank you so much um, for sparing the time on red carpet day, uh, the premiere of this film, to speak with us here on The Hub on Hollywood. Um, we talked a little bit earlier about films that, you, you, you know, that just rankled you and made you want to leave the theater. This is not one of them. This is one of these that you will laugh, you will cry, um, and you would just be compelled to the very end and leave feeling just more profound, more connected to humanity. It was just a wonderful job um, done in the telling of this story. Uh, you really get that feeling of the bonds made in war that tr transcend everything, really. Um, and also the, the hopelessness, the despair, the power of the human spirit, the power of love, and we're not talking about romantic love here. We're talking about the, the, the love of your fellow man. It's a story of saving and being saved and owing so much to someone. And not only the hopelessness of war, right? But the hopelessness of bureaucracy, of what so many of these translators faced in the broken promises of the US military and what a travesty that was. Um, and Guy Ritchie just does such a phenomenal job of pulling you down into this feeling and putting you into these characters' positions um, that you can't help but walk out of it with a greater understanding. Um, so I just believe it's such an important film and it's such a great film and you really need to go see it and experience it in theaters right now, uh, The Covenant. No, that's fantastic to hear because this is one of the movies uh, of 2023 that I'm looking forward to, to watching. Also a big Guy Ritchie uh, movie fan and uh, Jake Gyllenhaal, anything with him in it. Uh, he gives his all uh, in every film that he's in. So, you know, it's, it's always like a sure thing. Uh, but The Covenant out in theaters right now, hopefully out on streaming services soon as well, because as uh, as I mentioned, I'm a new dad, so I'm going to be watching more things at home mm -hmm. uh, in the comfort of my couch while holding a, a little gremlin, little gremlin baby. <laughs> I'll take that part out while holding a little baby. <laughs> <laughs> there you, go. you can keep it. I mean, yeah, everybody, everybody who has a kid understands. Look, you love them. They're beautiful. They're perfect. But when they get They're hungry, angels. When they when they get hungry, they they 
transform. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I just wanted to add one last thing about the covenant. Uh, it, it starts a little bit slow, I'd say, is is my only critique. But then it grabs you by the collar, and boy, are you in for a ride. So um, let Buckle us know up. if you've seen the. I know, right? <laughs> Woo! Um, let us know if you've seen the covenant. What did you feel about it? Um, did you did you enjoy it? Let us know uh, your experience in the theater uh, watching The Covenant down below. Thank you for joining us on The Hub on Hollywood. Yeah, and stick around after the episode because we have more casting calls, local casting calls here in New England that will help you, uh, just like Chris Ochoa, uh, find yourself on the big or small screen and everything in between. Uh, before The Hub on Hollywood, I'm James. I'm Jamie. See you next time. Bye. All right, on this week's casting calls, we got a lot of cool ones and uh, some cool cat ones, too, that we will get to in just a minute. But first, starting off, we have Boston Casting looking for Asian, Latina, and black women 18 to 20 years old with acting experience. This is for a feature film. Nothing to sneeze at. So really cool stuff. Union and non-union opportunity. It is a paid gig. This shoots um, in uh, June uh, through July And so if you are a woman, Asian, Latina, black woman, 18 to 20 years old, send in your headshot, your photo, resume, bio, where you live, and your contact information. Send that to bostoncastingsubmit1, the number one, at gmail.com. And in the subject line, put best place shoot slash your name. I'm 21. Do you think I could make it? You think yeah, I could? yeah. You made you made the cut. You made the cut. <laughs> okay. Definitely. I'm not. Tw- I'm not 21, guys. Okay. All right. Slate casting. Uh, they're looking for non-union talent of all ethnicities, 20s to 40s, for background work in a fun commercial, uh, portraying restaurant patrons and staff. This is again non-union. So you are going. This is going to be shooting on May 1st. Also, if cast. Um, If you're interested and fully available for the shoot date, please send an email with your name, phone number, city and town you live in, headshot, close up, and a head to toe photo. Um, Two, you're going to want to send all of that to slatecastingextras at gmail.com. And in the subject line, write restaurant extras. Boston Casting looking for Japanese men for a commercial. This is a non-union gig. We're looking for somebody in their 20s to 50 years old. Uh, this shoots 850 bucks for the shoot and 50 bucks for the fitting. This takes place next month on the 8th and 9th. So if you are a Japanese man, uh, send in your information, email, current photos, where you live. Send that to Boston Casting Submit 1, the number 1, at gmail.com. And in the subject line, put Japanese mail, 20s through 50s, slash your name. All right, and Slate Casting is also uh, looking for families in the DMC. That's the D.C., Maryland, and Virginia area. They're looking for Asian and Latino families who have kids between the ages of 5 and 19. It pays really well if you are cast. No acting experience necessary, um, though this is a non-union project. If that sounds like you or someone you know in the D.C. area, you're going to want to send a few family photos names, contact information, ages of the kids, city and state you live in, and send that all to slaterealpeoplecasting at gmail.com. All right, this next one, we are looking for some cool cats, literally. Boston Casting is looking for cats who are comfortable being outside on a harness. Now, I have my own cat, JB, Special Agent Jack Bauer, however... She does not do well outside. Uh, She also especially does not do well on a harness, so she's missing her opportunity. But if you know a cat who is comfortable with both for this commercial project and pays $1,200, send in uh, photos, age of your cat, comfort level in in harness, uh, photo if you want to be considered to work with your cat, where you are based, and your information. Send that to pets at bostoncasting.com pets at bostoncasting.com in the subject line put cat casting slash your name 
Is that really JB's name? Like, is that what it stands for, yeah, Jack Bauer? Her, her her legal name on the adoption papers is Special Agent Jack Bauer, but she goes by JB. <laughs> <laughs> How am I only just knowing that? I'm only just discovering that. That's amazing. Right? So, um, if you've got your own little furry special agent, definitely put in for this opportunity. Thank you for joining us on The Hub on Hollywood. Stick with us next week for more amazing interviews, local entertainment news, and uh, news about James's cat, apparently. I'm sorry. <laughs> I mean, casting calls. Yeah. Catting calls um, here on The Hub <laughs> on Hollywood. Thanks for being with us. Like us, share us. Gotta have us. Everything in between. Until next week. Everything <laughs> in between. Love it. Uh, until then, we'll see ya. I'm Jamie. I'm James. Bye. Bye.